today we are here with psychologist Dan Willingham and we're going to talk about kind of uh, fads and science in education. So before we start, so I'm dying to ask Dr. Willingham some questions, I want to introduce him really quickly. So Dan Willingham is a psychologist at the University of Virginia where he's a professor in the Department of Psychology. He earned his BA from Duke University and his PhD in psychology, Cognitive Psychology from Harvard University. He writes the Ask the Cognitive Scientist column for American Educator magazine. He's also the author of several books, including Why Don't Students Like School? Question mark. When Can You Trust the Experts? And a forthcoming book on reading, which is called The Reading Mind. So uh, without further ado, let's, let's uh, get right into it. Dr. Willingham, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, great to be here. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Sure. I'm really excited to have you on because I know that um, a lot of the work you do um, is dedicated towards trying to dispel certain fads in education that maybe the research data doesn't quite support. So I want to start thinking about a few of those because my own experience as a college professor is that, and as a former teacher, is that ideas really spread like wild, sometimes without really getting a handle on the literature, and then sometimes they're dispelled, but it doesn't really make it into the, into the classroom because the ideas are so entrenched. Um, and I know you've done some work on some things like learning styles, which obviously is still going strong, even though research doesn't really support it, or brain-based education, which, again, is still kind of going strong, research doesn't support, um, or at least a lot of the research doesn't support. So I guess the first question I have for you is, do you have any thoughts on why some of these ideas spread so quickly, even if they're not really grounded in the research? And why they persist even after people like yourself have come along and, and say, you know, honestly, the psychology the research doesn't support these. Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. And let, let me preface my answer by making clear uh, this is not a research-based answer. Uh, this, it would be great if it were, but um, this is really guesswork on my part. Um, and this is, in truth, a question why. Um, what makes ideas appealing? Why do they spread? This obviously is something that could be empirically studied. I think there's been, you know, smidgens of work on this here and there within education. I don't know of anything real systematic. Uh, so I'm left with, uh, with guessing. Sure. Um, and, and my sense is that, um, you know, teachers are eager for tools of high utility. Um, and uh, the things that spread like wildfire are things that sound like they have a lot of utility. That's one thing. The second thing is I think there probably is something, uh, and this is based not on research specifically within education, but research much more broadly about human belief and persuasion, that we're much more open to new ideas that are con seem consistent with everything else that we believe. Uh, so, for example, a lot of times we have very broad and um, probably almost unconscious, certainly largely unexamined assumptions about the world that can cut across um, many different areas of inquiry. So one such assumption might be, for example, uh, children are born in a state where they're essentially good, uh, their impulses are good. Uh, nature is benevolent and children are in some sense closer to nature. So if I come up with a uh, strategy for instruction, for example, that uh, is all about sort of a, a rather punitive approach to classroom management and seems to key on assumptions that if you don't watch kids every minute, kids will misbehave and you'll lose control of your classroom. Well, if this runs counter to your assumptions, you're just not going to be very open to that. Uh, whether, you know, whether I've got good evidence, mediocre evidence, or no evidence, it's going to be, that's going to be a tough sell for me to convince you. Uh, and then, obviously, the opposite is equally true. I'm suggesting that if I um, offer you something by way of classroom tools that seems to be pretty consistent with the way you see kids and how you think about kids, even if I don't have much evidence for this specific, uh, specific intervention, it seems to jive pretty well with what you already believe. You're probably going to be a lot more open to it. So those who buy your book and read your book, When Can You Trust Experts, especially teachers, uh, will find a book that is actually quite largely about science and how it works, which yeah. it probably isn't the expected reading. Um, but it really is a book that's ultimately for educators and about education. So why is understanding how science works 
so important for educators who want to think about strategies that they should be using in the classroom and in their schools? I think the relationship between uh, science and practice is really fraught in education. And a lot of people have a hard time knowing what to think about it. I think educators frequently feel like, yes, of course, you know, I, I, I accept that there are scientists studying how children learn and what the emotional lives of children are like. At the same time, I feel like I, I'm frequently getting cudgeled by research that I'm being told to do something, and research is being used as a weapon to, to get me to do it. Um, and I, I, I resent that, and I resent it primarily because I don't always trust that the research is really there, but at the same time, I feel, I feel kind of helpless. Uh, because I myself am not a researcher, and even if I were, you know, I already have a full-time job, thanks very much. And so how am I supposed to, like, when my assistant principal comes and says, I want you to do this now, all the research, uh, uh, says that that's the right thing to do, and the teacher feels like, I don't, you know, I've never done that. I don't think it's a good idea. Rubs me the wrong way. I don't see how it's going to fit into my classroom, but I don't know how to answer that. The research all says it's the right thing to do. So what I tried to do in that book, the reason if there's so much about basic science is that I think a crucial part of understanding when science is going to be helpful in applied settings like the classroom uh, in order to understand that, you really need to understand the relationship between the two. And I felt like in that book, I did as much to sort of uh, make clear what science can't do, questions to which science is ill-suited. Uh, and there are lots of questions in education where science is going to have nothing to contribute. So I think it's important to be clear-eyed about that as well, because I think there are narrow aspects of educational practice where science can really help. I'm like, we should pay attention to science. But there's a lot of it where we really shouldn't be paying attention to science. Well, I know that uh, you've written several articles for, um, for your column and elsewhere um, on, I, I think this is one of the areas you say science probably isn't developed enough, is on brain-based education and neuroscience. And in some ways, the claims in brain-based education are that a lot of neuroscience can really help us with these basic pedagogical uh, principles. And you've been uh, and others have been somewhat critical of the idea. Not that neuroscience could never do it, but at least that neuroscience isn't developed in the extent that studying what brain areas light up when we do actual lie is really going to give us any firm grounding. Is, is that one of the areas that you have in mind? Uh, it wasn't, but you're 100% right. Um, that wasn't what I was thinking of at the moment, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I've been a, uh, in one sense, a booster of um, uh, trying to draw on neuroscience to help education, but at the same time have been extremely cautious about um, the frequency with which that's helpful. So in other words, I think it's a good idea. We should be looking at it, uh, but it's very easy to uh, conclude that uh, well, you know, the, the mind is what the brain does, and so knowing something about what the brain is doing is bound to be helpful. It's really not bound to be helpful. Um, I was just a moment ago saying you need to be really cautious in drawing on basic sciences, and what I really had in mind was sort of basic cognitive science about how memory works um, or how attention works, uh, that you need to be very cautious about applying that in the classroom. And the, the reason, there are, a lot, there are several reasons for that, but the most important is the easiest to appreciate, which is that as a researcher of memory, when I'm trying to study memory, I'm going to isolate uh, a child or an adult in a room. Why? Because I don't want distraction. I'm going to pay them. Why? Because I, don't, I want to motivate them. Right? Because I want to study memory. That's what scientists do, right? We get rid of all the variables we can, so we can just look at that variable in isolation. Uh, it's like growing something in a petri dish. We know it's artificial, but one of the idea is that initially we want to understand how the thing works in isolation, and then we'll start adding variables and complicating the situation. Okay, well, that's all very nice, but what it means is if I learn something about memory in the laboratory, you can't plonk it down into a classroom where, you know, distraction is a factor and motivation is a factor and all that. It may still be useful, what I've learned in the laboratory, but you can't take that for granted. Now add... It, it, there, at least, we were talking about variables that a teacher could control. So we're looking at something like repetition, or we're looking at something like different modalities, reading the material versus seeing the material, something like that, all things that a teacher can manipulate. 
Now you go to neuroscience and you start talking about outcomes that teachers don't really care about, right? So like there's more dopamine. Well, that's, that's all very nice. But so, you know, a teacher's not going to go to a parent and say, man, your child got, had so much dopamine today. It's just fabulous, right? Parents, it's not just the parents not going to care what that means, uh, know what that means. Parents not going to care, right? It's like, well, I want, you know, how's the reading going? Don't tell me about the dopamine level, right? And likewise, so that's like outcomes. And then likewise, in terms of what teachers control, Teachers are not going to go in and, you know, jiggle the hippocampus or something, or, except in very rare cases, uh, try to manipulate the chemistry of the brain, right? So in terms of both what teachers are doing to, uh, doing to kids or for kids or creating environments that influence kids, it's all behavioral. In terms of outcomes that we care about, it's all behavioral. It's not neural. So the question is, how are we going to, like, take what a teacher does, translate that into neuro something, then take the outcome, which is neuro something, and translate it back into behavior. Right. That's the stuff we really care about. So how's that round trip going to help us? Right. The answer is, and I've written about this in different places, I think there are instances where you can point to and say, yeah, actually, we really learned something important there. Um, but those instances are few and far between. And most of the time when you read brain-based uh, education stuff, uh, it's it's making errors of influence. Gotcha, gotcha. So you go into your book into kind of what teachers and others should do when they're when they're uh, I guess confronted with people who say, like you said, the research says this. All the research says this. Yeah. Right. And your your methodology is uh, I mean there's steps to it. So you, know, you have flip it, strip it, trace it, and analyze it. Right. So. Um, I guess the question should be, when teachers are confronted with, all the research says this, therefore do this. Um, what should a teacher do? I mean, bearing in mind that teachers aren't scientists, but there's certain steps we can take to kind of figure out what's, what's bogus, what is actually something worth taking. Yeah, so this is, um, the, the, this is exactly why I wrote the book. So in talking with teachers uh, and talking with them about this frustration, I said, what if, what, you know, what if I tried to write a book that was, you know, if you're not a researcher and you're nevertheless supposed to be evaluating research, what would you do? Which, when you think about it, is very strange. And education may be unique. If it's not unique, it's narrowly unique in this sense. So the problem educators face is not at all unique, which is you go to school, you get trained, you learn all this, you know, what you hope is the latest research about how to be a good practitioner, and then you go into practice. And other people are still like, you know, what we hope developing new techniques that, you know, might be even better. Uh, so how do you keep up? And other professions like medicine, that problem is taken very seriously, and there are reliable annual, typically, guides that are published. Um, that sort of let the practitioners know, okay, you know, we used to do this for, you know, strep throat or whatever it is, and we don't do that anymore. Here's a quick rundown of the literature, so now it seems that we should be doing this. Um, teachers don't, and administrators don't have anything like that. They're just totally left to fend for themselves. Uh, and many of them, you know, took, took a smattering of research during their training, but they wouldn't call themselves researchers, and it's not something they spend a whole lot of time thinking about. So, yeah, the purpose of that book was to create a, this, as you said, I ended up with four steps, one of which I actually end up concluding this doesn't really help. Um, uh, four steps uh, to uh, help you think about whether or not a, 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 a practice is going to be helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not going to try and summarize the back end of that book in, in 15 seconds here. I'll just mention in, in passing the one step uh, that I conclude is not helpful is uh, what uh, trace it. And trace it means find out where the idea came from. And what I argue in the book is this is something that is usually a quick shorthand that all of us use throughout our lives to sort of say, is this, is this coming from a trustworthy source? Um, and in many instances, it makes perfect sense. So when an electrician comes to my house, I don't, you know, feel like I need to, you know, find out in details about how he or she does, you know, electrical work because I know the license. Uh, and so someone is sort of vouched for them. Uh, I feel like in education, a lot of times we use proxies for that sort of licensing expertise. So we say, 
oh, well, this person is a professor at a prestigious university, so they must know what they're talking about. And what I end up saying is that's what's most commonly used for as a, as a proxy for believability, and it doesn't work. Right. Um, there, there's lots of people with prestigious uh, degrees saying stuff that is not research-based. I know the step that really uh, helped me, I think, most and really made the most sense to me is kind of the idea of stripping um, the claim, figuring out really precisely what the claim is saying, what it isn't saying. So the, the example that I think uh, you, you've uh, written about very well is learning styles. Uh, there's a, very, a lot of confusion on what uh, learning styles, uh, what the idea of learning styles is supposed to say. And right. really what it's supposed to say when you really strip it down is that people have um, a way that they actually learn information best, not a way they prefer information best, but a way that they actually learn best. And I think you bring up examples like if I am studying the shape of a country, it's absurd to think that someone actually really will learn that uh, through text best, right? It's, it's always going to be a visit. So the idea is to strip it, it's kind of really boiling the thing down to what is it really saying? Uh, and, and yeah. Um, yeah, and I'll just mention, so I said I, w I don't want to try and summarize the whole uh, half of the book briefly, but I'll tell you, when someone says in, you know, in 15 seconds, what do you recommend a teacher do when they're confronted by, they're asked to do something that doesn't seem uh, right. And the other thing is, I mean, there's, there's a power dynamic that's usually at play here also. Teachers, uh, in, in, at least most of the teachers I talk to feel like, you know, I can't just go up to the superintendent of the district and say like, okay, show me the research, you know, I don't feel comfortable doing that. So here's, uh, this is a, a variant on strip it of get clear on the claim. What I encourage teachers to, to think of is just a couple of brief questions. One, what is it that's actually supposed to happen? What are we expecting is gonna change? How will we know whether or not that's actually happening? And then third, by when do we expect it to happen? And it's surprising the, the frequency with which things are started in districts where that's not very clear. So like to me, the, mo the most common is one-to-one -one laptop or one-to-one -one tablet. Um, and in some districts I've been in, so the first one of those questions in particular, what is it that's supposed to change? What's the outcome that you're expecting? What's gonna happen that's, that's gonna be improved? Sometimes they've got a very clear plan for what that is. Frequently they don't. Um, and there's just this sense that things will get better or in the case of technology frequently, it's that if we don't do it, something bad's gonna happen, like our kids are gonna be behind in some way. Right, sure. So uh, so that we're not getting too much into the doom and gloom of all the stuff that's out there that's not really backed by science, let's get into some of the, the positive stuff because you've written a lot about, I mean, there's certain things that really, really do work. And surprisingly, some of those things aren't stuff that, that that's in the air. So uh, what are a few of the things uh, that research really supports it really does work. One of the ones I teach my students about, and there's a lot of literature on it now, is just the, the art of retrieval. It's just plain and simple. The more you're quizzed on something, the more you're forced to retrieve something from your brain, the better that connection gets. But, uh, you know, that's not, a, that's not a very fun sounding thing, so it doesn't get out there and there. So what are some of the things like that, or if you want to talk to us also about that, uh, that really do work and the research really does support? Yes, yeah, so I would say that's, one, that's a great example, and it's one example of a broader set of skills that I would point to as something really important that I think is not uh, getting as much attention as deserves, which is uh, teaching kids how to use and regulate their own memory. So starting in upper, upper element, I mean, you think about it, you know, kindergarten, we, our expectations for kids and like how they're gonna manage their own learning is close to zero, which seems absolutely appropriate for kindergartners, right? We totally come to them. Um, but then, you know, increasingly, we're placing demands on kids to understand how their own memory works. It's fine in upper elementary or certainly in middle school to send a child home with a textbook uh, with the expectation they're gonna read that and understand it. Uh, not only read and understand it, and that that's, obviously very different prose than narrative, which is what they've been taught to read. Um, but also, you know, they might be asked to study for a quiz, right? So it's not just read and understand this complicated text, but actually commit a lot of it to memory. Uh, you mentioned retrieval practice. We know a lot of other stuff about techniques for memory. We know a lot about uh, good techniques and uh, worse techniques for taking notes. Um, 
So these are, uh, um, again, I would, I would say retrieval practice is part of a broader set of skills for uh, knowing how to work with and regulate your own memory that goes largely untaught. The reason I say it goes largely untaught is because studies of college students uh, show that these students do not know how, <laughs> they don't know these techniques at all. Um, this work originally started, um, most, the most recent wave of research on uh, how to student study started at UCLA, continued at places like Williams College and Kent State, so pretty selective institutions, um, indicating that uh, these, these students who not only managed to graduate high school, not only managed to you know, decide to go on to college, but actually got into and are succeeding at very selective colleges, uh, did so not because of their great study strategies, but in spite of pretty mediocre study strategies. So that, that's a big one. That's the one I've been thinking about a lot recently. Um, a few other quick hits. Uh, I think we know some useful things about how to manage math anxiety. I think we know some useful things about developing um, uh, good conceptual representations of numerosity in very young children. I think that's coming for us. I think we're learning more and more about how to use gesture. Uh, everyone's been very, very focused on manipulatives. We know a little bit more than we used to about the fact that manipulatives, uh, if they're not the right sort of manipulative, can distract as well as amplify understanding. But I think uh, we're learning more and more about how gesture can help. In, uh, especially in sort of spatial domains like physics and uh, in mathematics. Um, reading, of course, I think is probably, uh, you could point to as educational psychology's biggest success in terms of persuading pretty much everybody that phonics instruction of one sort or another is really important and needs to be part of, uh, of any reading program. Sure. So let's get into, uh, you alluded to reading instruction, let's get into a little bit about what your new book is, is going to be about. It's called The Reading Mind. And as of uh, this recording, late September 2016, it has not come out yet. So give us a, a little taste of what we can find in that book. So it's, it's interesting. I wrote a book for parents called Raising Kids Who Read. And when the way that book was originally structured was uh, it had sort of the science of reading in the front, and then it had what to do to encourage kids to read in the back. And it got sent out for uh, review uh, to a bunch of parents, and they said, well, we kind of liked it when you told us what to do. We really didn't like having to read all that science uh, to, to, get to, to get to the advice. We like the advice part. Uh, so I had, you know, like 20,000 words of the science of reading that I didn't quite know what to do with. The, uh, the reading mind ends up being exactly that. So it is meant to be a book for teachers of reading or future teachers of reading to sort of have a mental model of what's happening when um, a skilled reader, so it's not a book about re learning to read, it's a book about someone who knows how to read, what's actually happening in the mind as they do that. Uh, so it starts, it's sort of like a little boxes and arrows model, like there's working memory and it points to long-term memory. Uh, but it's sort of, that's sort of built up chapter by chapter with all the pieces of reading. Um, and, and so that's, that's what the book's about. Great. That sounds fascinating. If it's uh, like your other books, is clearly written and as interesting as the other books, I, I'm absolutely fascinated. So, uh, Dr. Willingham, thank you for sharing your time with us today. Oh, great pleasure. Thanks for having me. Sure.